Hey, good morning, guys. Um, good morning. We are here hey. today to talk to two brilliant industry experts um, around the topic of qual and quant in the world of digital optimization. So um, we'll get into intros here first, but uh, I'm fortunate to have these two brilliant folks alongside me. We've all gotten to work together a bit before um, on uh, engagements together. And so we're, we're able to bring that perspective together and share um, sort of what works and, and what we're seeing in the industry around qual and quant and that intersection. Um, and uh, yeah, just excited to, to dive in and hear your thoughts on, um, on today's blog post. So uh, with that, maybe Beth, if you wanna lead us in with your intro. Sure, thanks for having me, Jenny. Uh, my name is Beth Damiano. I've been in digital marketing uh, for about a little over 10 years now. Um, I've had a primary focus on email and CRM and web optimization over that time frame, um, primarily on the agency side. So I historically, as well as today, typically work with clients on their email and or web optimization programs um, and sort of lead from the strategy and execution side of things. So. Currently, I work for Accenture Interactive, uh, doing just that, leading digital experience strategy for my clients. Awesome. awesome. And Beth, you and I have gotten to work together on the Accenture Interactive side with this great guy that we get to hear his intro next, one of our favorite clients, Cole. Yeah, thanks for having me as well. Um, I'm Cole Ranzow. I have been and super, super happy to be here and talk with both of you. Um, like you said, we've been working together, so I'm excited just to kind of hang out and, and talk some digital. Um, for me, over the past 10 years, I've got to experience many different areas within digital, including and kind of starting out in the paid search space, moving into SEO, focus on conversion rate optimization, UX content strategy, all of which have leaned heavily, or I've leaned heavily on really that data side to help inform decisions that I'm making. And I think even, my first job out of college, I started with the Minnesota Timberwolves. And in that role, I was actually working a lot with fans and fan experience and was doing qualitative research without even really knowing that I was doing it. Like I would always be documenting areas of the fan experience that our fans were talking about that they liked, or if they had frustrations, I would like start to mark it down kind of in a notebook on the side and would start to be able to come back to them then if they had frustrations be like, oh, maybe you should do this or check out this and try to always continually help help guide them. And I think that helped lead me into kind of the current role and the current like passion I have for really understanding users and helping create experiences for them. And so my current role is I lead an experience strategy team at Strategic Education Inc. And awesome. that's you want to tell us a little bit about the brands that the SEI or Strategic Education Inc. works with? Yeah, yeah. So um, the primary brands that I work with in strategic education are Capella University, Strayer University, and then our Sophia, which is, uh, uh, they, they offer like low cost gen eds to our students. And within strategic ed, within that experience strategy team, I, my, I guess my focuses are really on content strategy, UX research, and then that testing and optimization team. Um, and a big part of what I do is really help bring those insights to our product teams. And a massive part of that is really done through storytelling with data. So again, really excited to kind of dig into this a little bit deeper with you. Awesome. I love it. And uh, to tie us all in a bow, um, I'm Jenny Bruckman. I'm the VP of Customer Success and Strategic Partnerships at Wevo. All that means is I get to have conversations like this all day long. And so we're, um, we're thrilled to dig in and talk about some of the ways that um, both of these brilliant folks are working together and, and really leveraging the best in class tools and processes and methodologies. So with all of those intros and everything uh, behind us, we'll dive into uh, to our first question. So i um, curious, you, you kind of touched on this a little bit in your intros, but I'm curious what your areas of focus are for your teams today. So maybe Cole, if you want to lead in and go first. Yeah, I think just like I said, with, with content strategy, we're really focusing on how are we telling the best story possible within our digital experience, um, really understanding what are the needs and wants of our users and then bringing that together through content 
Um, we do, the second focus is really UX research. So that's a lot of what we're gonna be talking about here today, the qualitative side of usability studies and really understanding like the why behind the, the problem. Um, and then lastly, the, the third part of kind of my team is testing and optimization. So really focus on how are we continuing to prove the conversion rate within our experience and um, in doing so, doing a lot of A-B tests and partnering with, with Beth in the process. Awesome, perfect segue to you, Beth. Uh, what are your areas of focus for the team and, and your projects today? So mine are probably a little more broad. So from me personally, when I'm working with my clients, I have individual kind of focuses and goals for each one, depending on what we're working on. And so that focus could be building a culture of data driven optimization, right? And getting buy-in from teams and really empowering the organizations to embrace uh, optimization. And so that could be the focus for one client. Um, while the other one could be velocity, maybe they already have a organization that is built on data driven optimization like SEI, for example, I don't have to spend a lot of time focusing on getting everybody on board because they're already on board. And so in that capacity, I really take on whatever my clients goals are. So if it's velocity, getting a num certain number of tests out or getting certain number of insights or growing their conversion rate or their revenue by a certain percentage by the end of the year. So for me, it will vary a little bit. And I think that's why I've stuck within the agency realm. I love being able to dive into retail and e-commerce in the morning. And then I'm diving into higher ed in the afternoon. And then I'm wrapping up the day looking at financial institutions just across the board and being able to pull all of that together and share that then back with my clients too, because obviously some things industry-wide are specific, some things can cross over. And so for me, my focus is, is changing daily and changing kind of with my clients as we go. So it really depends, but overall, um, again, their goals are my goals. So I'm going to focus on that, but then also just always wanting to again, from an agency side, deliver really high quality, insightful work and being able to help that company grow regardless of what it is. Is it bottom line? Is it insights? Is it getting to know the customer or the prospect? Um, so it shifts a little bit for me. Love it. Um, that's a perfect segue. We all come from a, a shared background of a passion for A-B testing and optimization. So Maybe Beth, if you'll continue that thought a little bit around really how have you seen the, the needle move um, for your business and the, the businesses that you run for your different clients using quantitative A-B testing? Yeah, so I think the fact that I've been in it for 10 years is probably evident that I have seen the bottom line move. Um, it's frankly my job to make sure that through these optimization programs, we are able to impact that bottom line. Um, so for us, Obviously, the, the ultimate goal with testing is to have winners, right? We want to improve the user experience. And through that, we want to impact the bottom line. So whether it's revenue or leads or what, whatever that final goal is, um, we always want to have winners. And so those are really where we're going to impact that bottom line. But I'm a big uh, advocate of losers are awesome as well. And the primary reason for that is those are going to teach us the most about our prospects, our customers, what have you. So when we put an experience in front of them and the data is very clear and confident that we did not improve the experience, it usually tells us a big red flag as to why. And it's usually really the most beneficial to be able to understand what they don't like just as much as it's important to understand what they do like. Um, and so from a business perspective, both of those elements really help impact the business on all different fronts from just knowledge of our user base uh, all the way through to whatever that bottom line is. Again, leads, revenue, whatever that is. Um, but I think it goes far beyond just the bottom line of the business. I think data, uh, be it quantitative or qualitative, is going to help you make overarching marketing decisions as well. I mean, something as simple as, you know, they don't like this verbiage on a button or they don't like this type of imagery, that could, in theory, your brand will have consistency across the board, right? Whether it's in your ads, your emails, your website. And so all these insights can actually help make broader marketing changes across the whole business. So I love that part as well that 
we can move the needle on a specific metric from a specific experience that we've tested, but then we can also broaden the horizons and really impact an overall strategy for the business as well. That's great. I love that. Um, Cole, I would love your thoughts similarly on, on really where, where you've seen uh, testing move the needle. Yeah, I would say all of what Beth just said. <laughs> um, I think there's there's a saying, always be testing. And I think you could change that to say, always be learning. Um, so mm -hmm. just like you were, I think those are two, you're out trying to optimize the experience itself. But I think there's a lot to be said about that learning. And like you were saying, Beth, like not all tests are going to be moving the needle from a conversion perspective, but they are moving the needle as far as just overall knowledge and education about your experience about your users. And I think at strategic education, we're really focused on doing what is best for the user and continually looking to improve our digital experience to create something that's actually like impactful and helpful and easy for our users and ultimately for a positive result for our business. And I think, you know, over the last year, we've seen some really strong performance as a result of our testing program in partnership with um, Beth and Accenture. And the one thing to always remember again is not every test is going to move the needle from a conversion perspective, but it's important to learn from those and leverage those learnings to really propel you into the next great idea or the next big strategy. And I think um, being able to learn from those, you know, losers, if you will, they're also a really good opportunity to dig in from a qualitative perspective to say, why was this a loser? It's easy to see like, that this experience didn't work, but really digging in and understanding why didn't it work um, can is really the the key there to help understanding how to improve it. Yeah, I, like you, I was just going to add to that the always be testing, always be learning. Like I love that mantra because what worked for us today is not necessarily going to work for us a year from now or a month from now, right? Like the the world is always changing, the surrounding environments are always changing. I think if 10 years ago we looked at websites and compared them to today, I don't think at 10 years ago we would have said, well, we're going to get rid of all the content, right? We're going to streamline things and make it really simple. It always feels like we need to do more and more and more. And so yeah. that concept of always iterating and you could test something today that maybe doesn't win or doesn't move the bottom line, but it's definitely something that could be worth testing again six months or a year or two years from now depending on how things shift. So I love that like mantra of just always learning, always testing and. Yeah, I think that's not always a super comfortable place for everyone in the organization to be either. Like you're, you're always trying to take what's already working and improve upon it. And in sometimes in doing that you're there's gonna be some, some missteps, but it's those missteps that you learn from to, that will get you to that next, like next uh, step. Um, and that's how you get to step changes is by actually trying new and different things. And like you were saying in the industry, like we're trying to always look at like, not only what our competitors are doing in the space, but what are the really key digital brands doing? So what are the Googles, the Airbnbs, the, 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 the organizations or companies that you guys look at on your phone every single day, what are they doing and how can we start to learn things from them and start to test those as new experiences and just continually see how our users interact with it. That's amazing. It, it's, um, it takes that fear out of it, of the unknown, of, of uh, what didn't exist yesterday suddenly uh, can exist today because you can measure that, that customer reaction and the interaction with it. That's, yeah. that's really... That's really spot on. And the um, safe, I would say the safety net there too of testing, mm -hmm. like you're not just putting a brand new experience out there, like 100% all the way and kind of looking at it pre post with where a lot of different variables can come into play. You're doing it in a very like, um, a very like calculated area where you, if it's going bad after, you know, a few days or a week and you start to see that trend, you can turn it off right away and kind of revert back to what you had. Or if it's yeah. killing it, you can turn it up to 100% and look to implement. Yeah, yeah, that risk mitigation factor I think is huge. And I, that's always my like baseline when I get pushed back about, oh, we don't want to test something. Uh, it's just that 
you're going to learn and it's a controlled environment. And like you said, if it's not winning, turn it off. If it's killing it, let's push it all the way and be able to monitor that impact. It basically takes out that risk of just seeing something plummet and not knowing how to fix it. If you actually push that change to production. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, I'm curious how you've both uh, leveraged qualitative insights in, into that um, philosophy, how you've really leveraged qualitative and, and all of the, the uh, user insights that come from that into um, A-B testing efforts. Cole, maybe you want to lead in? Yeah, going back to like what, what I was saying with like tests that lose in a way, I think that's a good opportunity to dig in. And to me, the qualitative is what optimization is all about. It's being able, to, it's one thing just to see improvement or see decline in like the data, but when you actually use that qualitative, it can really help you answer why we are seeing what we're seeing and help you create a more informed user-centric experience as a result of it. I think I told you guys this before in previous, but I always think of this as like a three-headed attack of kind of the web data or quantitative research to help you show the what, the qualitative research to help you show the why, and then this A-B testing really helps show how to implement it. And that what, why, and how are so, so important into moving the needle for you and your business. Yeah, I would totally agree with all of that. Um, I think qualitative from my perspective comes in kind of hand in hand with qualitative data. Um, I think there's, when it comes to qualitative data, I think there's sort of like a gray cloud that sits above it that it's really hard to analyze. It's a lot of manpower, time. And so it's, not usually the first option. I think people default to the quantitative because it's there, they can run a report, you know, they can run scripts that make it look pretty and digestible. And it's just overall a little bit easier. Um, but I think the qualitative piece comes in hand in hand, just as Cole said, to give you the why. The, the data or the numbers from the quant side will tell us what happened and being able to validate that with the specifics of why that what happened <laughs> that mm -hmm. sounds funky but really to answer that question and i think they go hand in hand because uh, you know typically qualitative data is going to be a smaller audience pool whether you're doing a research study or you know, surveys, things like that, it's typically not going to be as large of an audience as your quantitative data is. And so you oftentimes don't get to statistical significance on results from that. And I think people associate that with meaning, well, it's anecdotal at best. And um, I kind of, I disagree with that a little bit, I guess, and in, in terms of you can pair those together to understand, okay, are what we're hearing specifically out of the customer's mouth consistent with what we're seeing because what people say and what people do can sometimes be conflicting. You know, they say they don't like something, but then they use it, you know, during that user testing session, right? Um, or they, they say just, they have an issue with something, but they actually didn't run into an issue. They got through the process fine as we wanted them to. So um, I think that is a way to help sort of validate the problems that you assume that you have, right? The data is kind of indicating that this area might be a problem and that qualitative piece is gonna help validate what you're seeing there. And so I think they really partner together to tell the full story because with one or just the other, you can't tell the full story. You can tell a story, you just can't tell the total complete package of what's going on. Yeah, I think you'd see that quite often too, where the quantitative will come back saying, this is what a user expects or wants. And then when you actually follow them through an experience in more of a qualitative setting, and you're actually seeing what they're clicking on and you're hearing kind of their inner dialogue tell you what they're expecting, what they're clicking, they always don't line up. So that's, there's a lot of insights and tells you can get from that. And then to be able to dig in and be like, well, why did you do that? Because over here you were saying this was your expected outcome, but you're actually doing something different. Yeah. And I think specifically for the AB testing approach, like for us, Cole, we saw that, right. We ran a test together that stemmed from an initial bout of qualitative research. And then we 
tested that through AB testing, right? So to a larger audience and mm -hmm. it didn't win, it didn't work so well. And so we were able to pair the initial findings with our quantitative data. We pivoted that approach and launched a variant or a pivot of that first test. And it turned into a large winner for us. And so I think that is like the prime example of being able to marry the two together to be able to actually find what is that optimal experience. Yeah. Love it. Love it. We could geek out and talk about this stuff all day long. <laughs> um, so, so that was super helpful to understand um, how you're leveraging those qualitative insights within, you know, AB testing programs. Are there any other ways that you're really leaning into qualitative insights in a broader way today? Cool. Yeah, I think we we were like continually doing kind of UX research, which tends to be more on the qualitative side. So whether it's card sorting for some navigation changes we have coming up, we've done quite a few diary studies where you actually follow a group of prospective students or students and they document everything that they're doing. And that ultimately helps us either build out a customer journey map for them or refine a customer journey map that already exists that really digs into key, key areas of needs and frustrations for those users within those specific aspects of their journey that we can then focus then in on, maybe even do some additional usability studies on specific experiences. And those usability studies we are doing sometimes before we launch big initiatives, sometimes after, sometimes both, but really help to ensure we're making it easy for the user and ultimately meeting their expectations. And I think that's where, you know, we've been leaning more and more on Weibo recently to help kind of do some of those usability studies across our site. Yeah, and I would add to that um, another area which some of my clients use qualitative data is just for a constant general source of feedback. So that could be like just a survey that is a consistent element in the bottom of an email, or sometimes their modals or whatnot that pop up on the site, but just something that is fairly consistent that people, if they are so compelled, can go ahead and click through and give that constant feedback. Um, is another way to just sort of stay in touch with the customer on an ongoing basis. Um, in those cases, from a survey perspective or things like that, we're typically able to get a little higher volume on the return. Um, now, surveys <laughs> should preface that usually you're extremely happy or extremely frustrated, which is what would prompt you to actually fill it out. Um, so you take that with a grain of salt, of course, but um, it's just another great way to have that almost kind of an ongoing dialogue in a sense that we're getting feedback. Um, it's getting prompted to them after they're seeing certain experiences so we can know what, you know, okay, they saw this email and they responded to the survey at this point, or they were on this page and they were prompted to the survey and they took it. And that can help us really understand just some, okay, what something here triggered them enough. Now let's look at their answers to see kind of what that was. Um, and that can help. Again, I, I alluded to this earlier, but just that overall marketing strategy, that feedback from customers can be beneficial across the business. So your ads, your, um, your site, your email, like any communication or experience that you're putting in front of the user, you can make larger sweeping changes based on some of that ongoing feedback that you're doing as well. That's terrific. Um, and you kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier. A lot of uh, organizations these days are, are running into walls um, on making quant and qual easier to understand. I'm curious from both your perspectives, what walls are your teams up against in terms of gathering reliable qualitative data? Maybe Beth, if you want to go first. Yeah, I think for most of my clients, when it comes up, it's typically the time and money. Uh, the manpower. It takes more manpower to analyze qualitative data. And I think that's just a matter of fact at this point in time. Um, I imagine as, of course, technology and such progresses, we'll likely get to a place where it's a little bit easier, but that's typically the biggest roadblock for my clients. Um, that's where uh, working with Wevo has really helped us. It's kind of a marrying of the two, of the qual and the quant. Um, and that full service aspect of, you know, we're gonna give you all the details and then you're gonna give us the <laughs> summarized results at a reasonable 
price is like going to be a game changer, I think, in the industry, because again, it takes a lot of time, just straight manpower and money to run what a typical, you know, user research test would be, right? If you're doing moderated or unmoderated studies, you know, with actual users and then having to spend the time to consolidate all of that feedback from even just 14 people. I mean, 10, 14 people can be a large chunk of time to have to navigate that. And so I think as technology progresses and we see a little more of the marrying of the two and how we can automate potentially some of this qual analysis, I think that's going to be a game changer. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I think time and money are, are the things there. I would even like thinking back to like when I started to even five years ago to now, I think there's been just organizationally quantitative is easier to understand and it's easier to trust because I think there's confidence in numbers. So even when you do get to the time and money conversation, if you have qualitative compared to quantitative that you can invest in, it was just easier sometimes to go to a quantitative route. Um, and I would even like thinking back, there would be times where we'd be starting to present out our qualitative research. And as soon as we like, were like, hey, and we did this moderated study where we talked to 10 people, you could see walls go up immediately in the room. And from that point on, it felt like we were on the defensive of like, no, 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 but we spent like hours with these people <laughs> and were, we were really able to understand their pain points, moments of delight, motivations, but you were always trying to like prove yourself and I think as we started presenting that qualitative alongside the web data and really use that quantitative to tell more of a cohesive story, it's like the qualitative is like the color to the story that the web data or quantitative research is, is showing. And once we started doing that, I think you started seeing more heads nod um, because it was either tied to a trusted source or it just made more sense. Um, and then I think another big thing that kind of helped with the time and money thing and helping people just trust it more is we started opening up our moderate, moderated usability studies to the broader organization. So they could start to come in and see firsthand what it's actually like, how a user is flowing through the experience, the type of questions they're asking, how we're documenting that. And then it's insane how much, so just think of 10 to 14 people and you're spending an hour with them each, that's 14 hours of now research and time that you have to go back and try to synthesize down. Um, so like you were saying, that consolidated research is really, really important. And I think that's where I've seen Weibo do a nice job too. Like Beth was mentioning that they think they do a good job of kind of balancing the quantitative and the qualitative and kind of marry those two together, but also the super detailed yet synthesized reports of audience reactions, industry benchmarks, user quotes, I think go a long way into having digestible information. And people don't love to read 10 page reports. They don't like, they want to know like, what, do, what is they it don't? that I, yeah, what is it that I need to know? And um, what is the data there to back it up? And I think that's where the qualitative and quantitative come together. And I think that's where I've seen Evo do a really nice job of that. And it's been, easier and we've seen really positive reactions within our organization even in sharing out some of our you know studies that we've started to use Vivo for. Yeah I think awesome. too because I think businesses just naturally lean toward the quantitative side because they have it anyway you know what I mean they're not a business is not going to not track their data right so they're going to want to know what their conversion rates are they're going to want to know that and so they have that built into their business practice. Whereas I think the qualitative piece is something you have to proactively layer in. It's not something that's going to be standard across the board that every company is going to have and utilize, whereas the quant data is. And so I think it's something that you have to, you know, whether you're the leader of the marketing team or what have you, it doesn't matter. You have to be proactively advocating for that element to help tell that full well-rounded story. Yeah. And like you said, I think they typically have teams already dedicated to the quant side where the yeah. qualitative side, there isn't, that isn't always the case. Yeah, exactly. That's terrific. Well, obviously we love uh, every, every test that we get to run with you guys and the value that we get to deliver. So it's, it's really great to hear that that's, um, that those are the specific ways in which we're able to deliver that value and um, we'll, we'll keep doing it, but that's, <laughs> um, that's terrific uh, context for us. Thanks.
Um, so kind of bringing us to the, to close, uh, as we, we've talked about sort of where we've come from and quant and qual, uh, would love to kind of pivot to where we're going. Um, so I'm curious from each of you, what's your prediction for the future of where quant and qual intersect in the world of digital optimization? Beth? I think they're going to be married hand in hand, <laughs> riding off into the sunset together. Um, I think qualitative, I mean, even just over the last 10 years, it's not like it's a new concept, but I do think it's more widely used today than it was five, 10 years ago. And I think that's going to continue. Um, I also frankly wouldn't be surprised. Again, my focus is a lot primarily on the A-B testing side. So I wouldn't be surprised if A-B testing tools start to expand their capabilities or functions to include elements of qualitative data. Um, because again, being able to marry the two together is really impactful. And so I would imagine, or I also hope as well, that that's something that will come, um, you know, not tomorrow, but eventually that uh, it'll become more commonplace that they are done together to really ramp up a program. You never uh, know. You never I think know that, in the <laughs> that visual you just put in my head of qualitative and quantitative riding off into the sunset together. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> gonna stick with me. <laughs> um, I would I would agree to that. I think they're they're gonna be they've you've already seen them become more closely and closely aligned, and I think that just continues to happen when that magic moment is. I don't know, but I think we'll continue moving in that direction. And like, like I said earlier, like understanding the what, the why, and the how are going to be, those two pieces are super, super important in doing that. And I do think there's going to be more, more tools that come out, more integrations within those tools to help marry the two. Amazing. Thank you both so much for the thoughts and the time today. Um, this was just such a powerhouse combo of, of brilliant uh, industry expertise and um, hopefully others gain gain value from hearing a bit about it. And, and I know I certainly did. So um, we'll continue to look forward to, to launching more tests together and, and getting that um, always be learning motto ingrained uh, even deeper. But uh, thank you both so much. And um, we'll talk again soon.